Genesis 33, Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went, went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? he asked. Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, What's the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Please accept the present that was brought to you. For God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, Let's be on our way, I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are tender, and that I must care for the ewes and cows that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard just for one day, all the animals will die. So let my Lord go on ahead with his servant, while I move along slowly at the pace of the flocks and herds before me and the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord in Seir. Esau said, Let me leave some of my men with you. But why do that, Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Sukkoth, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. And that is why the place is called Sukkoth. After Jacob came from Pedam Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. For a hundred places, for a hundred pieces of silver, he brought he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Sechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. How good it is when our prayers are answered. It's one of the thrilling things, isn't it, about being a Christian, that God hears us, that we have this living God, a personal God, a merciful God, a gracious God who answers our prayers, especially if we've been very worried about something and we've got down on our knees and we poured out our hearts to the Lord. Like Jacob in chapter 32 and verse 7, in great fear and distress. Remember, it's been 20 years since he's seen brother Esau and things didn't end on a good note back then. He had uh, deceived his father and his brother, tried to steal, well, he had really stolen the blessing that was coming to the firstborn. Uh, so things hadn't gone well, and he was very, very anxious about the reunion, about the meeting with brother Esau. But Jacob here has a wonderful answer to his prayers. He prayed in chapter 32. Uh, the prayer is recorded in verses 9 to 12. And then later he has this, uh, this encounter with God by the, the brook, the Jabbok brook, from, chap from verse 22 in chapter 32. Uh, it's not a prayer as such, but it's, it's kind of an, an acted prayer, an, an acted wrestling with God, struggling with God, until God, in human form, blesses him. And so we see in 33 that the, the outworking of those prayers, of those engagements and encounters with God, and it is a wonderful answer to his prayers. I think the first answer is right at the beginning of the chapter, uh, well, particularly in verse 3, where we see Jacob with, a, with himself a new attitude. Jacob himself has been changed by his prayer. And of course, prayer does that, doesn't it? It doesn't only change the circumstances that we pray for, but it can change us to our own character, our own attitude. And here I think it gives uh, Jacob a new confidence. 
Jacob has been trying in chapter 32 to put as many people between him and Esau, brother Esau, as many messengers, as many gifts as possible uh, to, to sweeten um, Esau, to pacify him, as he says uh, in verse 20 of chapter 32. But now, here he goes on ahead. He's not holding back. He goes on ahead. There's a new courage and confidence in Jacob himself. A new spring in his step. And sometimes prayer can do that. When we've really engaged with God and wrestled with God in prayer, uh, we can have a new confidence, a new peace about us. The Bible promises, doesn't it, that when we present our requests to God, we're not anxious. We experience the peace that is beyond understanding, that transcends understanding. Philippians 4 verse 7. But then there's an answer, I think, that goes beyond the the highest hopes and expectations of Jacob, and that is in the welcome that brother Esau gives to him. Twenty years down the line, he's expecting great hostility. He's terrified when he hears that Esau is coming with a posse, a a small army of 400 men. Um, But here he receives, well, a wonderful reconciliation, reunion, welcome from Esau. You remember Jacob had simply asked in chapter 32 to be saved from his brother Esau, verse 11 of chapter 32, Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. He was terrified of carnage, not only for himself, but of his, his family, his, his whole entourage. He must have been so thrilled. He was expecting anger and violence. He prayed for salvation, but he gets so much more. Do you see how Esau welcomes him? He runs to meet him. Uh, not in order to, to, to punch him on the nose, but to embrace him. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. It's a beautiful welcome. And at this moment, Jacob must have been walking on air. His heart must have been floating. He was on cloud nine. Especially since just recently in chapter 31, that relationship with Uncle Laban, crafty Uncle Laban, has also been brought to a resolution. They've come to an agreement. And so Jacob's relationships are are, are sorting themselves out by the grace of God. And that's a lovely feeling, isn't it, when a relationship has been going south or pear-shaped and and things start to, to straighten out, to restore, to resolve. How good that is. He must have been deeply happy in this moment as Esau threw his arms around him, not to mention hugely relieved Uh, that he wasn't being chopped into little pieces by his brother. It is lovely, isn't it, when something we're really worried about turns out really well to our great surprise and immense relief. God does give us peace with each other as well as with himself. It's one of the great promises of the Bible. And he teaches us, he trains us how to live at peace with one another as far as it depends on us. That's one of the great commands of the book of Romans, to live at peace with each other as far as it depends on you. Of course, that might be limited, but as far as it depends on you. Here's a great assurance that God answers prayer. Those desperate prayers of 32 are are being answered here in a beautiful way, above and beyond all expectations for Jacob. And it's also an assurance that God can change people, even people who don't fear him, who don't follow him, who don't love him. Esau is a, is, is a beautiful person in this moment, isn't he? See, I don't think this was the usual Esau that we're seeing here. Other indications in the Bible are that he, was not, he wasn't a believer, that he wasn't a nice man. In fact, Hebrews, in the New Testament, Hebrews 12, 16, calls him a godless man. A godless man. 
Uh, and I think we, we do not see him acknowledging God like Jacob did. He does not seem to give credit to God in the way that Jacob does. Uh, for example, in verse uh, 11 of chapter 33, God has been gracious to me, says Jacob. He acknowledges that in a couple of places. Um, Esau, I think, considered himself a, a self-made man uh, and gave no credit to God. Yet what grace we see, don't we? Nonetheless, what grace we see from Esau in this moment as he forgives and embraces his cheating little brother, his manipulating, scheming, cheating little brother, Jacob, whose name means cheat or deceiver. Here at least in this moment, Esau was a really beautiful character, even a godly character like God himself. As Jacob says, I, I see the face of God in you. I, I see God in you. For this moment at least, Esau is here just like the father in Jesus' story of the prodigal son. I don't know if you remember that story. It's in Luke 15. The, the father who, who represents God and, and his beautifully gracious love. Do you remember when he sees the son, the, the son has gone off and squandered his inheritance in wild living. And when he sees his son afar off, uh, he, he runs to him. And it wasn't dignified for Middle Eastern fathers to run. It would be like seeing, um, well, it's the queen. She's passed away, so that's not going to happen, is it? Um, or the king. You don't see the king running. You don't see royalty running. You don't see dignified uh, characters running, do you? It's, it's undignified. But the father throws all of that to the wind and runs to his son. And, uh, and he embraces him. And the words that are used here and there in Luke 15 are very similar and probably in Jesus' mind at that moment as he, as he gave this story of the prodigal son, he was thinking of this incident between Jacob and Esau. Jacob, uh, Esau ran to meet Jacob, verse 4, and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. Almost exactly the same words about the father in the story of the prodigal son. It's a beautiful moment. And Jacob says that Esau's face in this moment was like the face of God. You know, he'd sort of seen the face of God, face to face with God in uh, his wrestling uh, match, the end of chapter 32. Um, verse 30 of chapter 32, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. Jacob had been expecting a very different face from Esau than this gracious face of God. And that's very exciting for us, isn't it? Because it reminds us of God's power to reach into people's hearts and change them, even, even if it's only for a short time. It reminds us of the power of prayer. Jacob had been spending a lot of time praying for this moment, this encounter, this event, as perhaps you have for things that you're anxious about. And as we pray for situations in our own lives, or people who may even be a threat to us, maybe interviews or presentations or going to school or various events that fill us with anxiety, even great fear and distress. And we see the outcome here of, of those desperate prayers as we wrestle with God. We've all done it, haven't we? We do see, don't we, also in our lives, unbelievers, people who don't follow Jesus, acting with real grace, with kindness, with forgiveness. Sometimes it puts us to shame, doesn't it, as Christians, when we see that, how kind they can be, great friendships, by the grace of God. I'm, I'm sure you can think of plenty of people in your life like that. I can. It's something to give thanks to God for. Like I say, I'm sure we've all had similar, similar experiences of God's gracious favor in answer to our prayers. Sometimes in our prayer meeting, we, we report in this way and we say, I was, I was very worried about this uh, moment and I cried to God for help and it's a wonderful answer for my prayer. This is truly God working through Esau at that moment. 
So Jacob's passionate prayers, his desperate prayers in 32, are beautifully answered above and beyond all his expectations. We see a change in Jacob, and we see a change in in Esau. And that, I think, is because of the grace of God and the prayers of Jacob. But it's not all we see in this chapter. I think we also see uh, Jacob falling back into some of his old habits, his old ways, his old scheming ways, even after all the grace he's been shown. And even after that dramatic encounter with God, the end of chapter 32, where he says he sees the face of God, he's wrestling with God in the form of a man. He falls back. He seems to fall back. Let me indicate, uh, let me show you the indications of that, the signs of that in this chapter. He seems, uh, in verses um, 1 and 2, for example, to be falling back into his old sin of favoritism. You remember, there's a huge problem um, with some of the parenting that goes on in Genesis. It's, it's kind of comforting for those of us who are parents and, and know that we've made a big mess of it a lot of the time. You do see a lot of dysfunctional families and parenting uh, that is far from ideal. And one of the big problems is there's favoritism. And so Jacob is a huge favoritism guy. He, he favors Rachel over Leah. He favors Rachel's children over Leah's children. Uh, and it's all a bit of a mess. And it seems to be happening here in verse 2, doesn't it? Because he makes sure that Rachel and Joseph are right at the back because he fears that Esau's going to go, going to go ape on him, basically. Uh, things are going to go pear-shaped, so he's going to keep them in the safest part. And, and Leah is uh, in front of Rachel. And again, it just, it's just a hint of that ugly old sin of favoritism, which is such a, a, a blight in a family, isn't it? Later, he seems to lie to his brother Esau because he promises, doesn't he, to ca I'll catch up with you in, in, in Seir, uh, this place, the end of verse 14. Um, but uh, it looks like really he has no intention of doing that because he actually heads off in a completely different direction and settles there for a number of years. And it seems like he's falling back into his old sin of, of lies and deception again. And then I think um, uh, most uh, writers, commentators think that he's, um, he's, he's only halfway obedient in terms of where he makes for after this encounter. God has told him to go back to the promised land in chapter 31, verse 3. And he, he does, but he only just gets over the border into Shechem uh, and fails to make his way all the way back to Bethel, uh, where he had that great dream of the angels going up and down, remember, on the, on the staircase. Um, and it feels like it's a kind of a halfway obedience that we're getting here from Jacob. A halfway obedience. A halfway obedience is like when you ask your son to take out the rubbish. I'm not thinking just of my son here, actually. Actually, this is some, to be honest, this is something that I do. Uh, but take out the rubbish. Instead of taking it right out to the bin, I leave it at the front door. Maybe it's raining outside. I think, oh, just, just put it outside the door. And in the morning, you know, I'll get it the whole way. But it's a halfway obedience. It's a partial obedience. Or when you tell a child not to play on the street and she plays. Technically, yes, she doesn't play on the street, but right on the edge of the street or on the, the, the pavement. Technically, yes, doing what she was told, but... Mm -hmm. Only a kind of halfway obedience. Uh, and that's a bit like us, isn't it? We, we, we go in for a half-hearted, halfway obedience sometimes. Not, not the full thing, not the, the wholehearted. In his book on Genesis, Kent Hughes wrote this, It's always a delusion to imagine that we have obeyed when we have partially obeyed. If God has called you to leave a relationship or a plan, or a pursuit, or a habit. Do not imagine that you have obeyed by partial disengagement. God cannot be fooled or mocked. Jacob's obedience was like that, wasn't it? It was partial. It wasn't total. There's, some, there's something about the old Jacob 
uh, sneaking in here. I, he, he's been changed by that encounter. He's been given a new name in 32. But the old Jacob is still, is still wrestling within him. I think we, we find something similar going on in ourselves. And, and, we, and we look now, I think, to Jesus because we want to look ahead always to Jesus in the Bible. Jesus is one of the sons, the great, 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 great grandsons of Jacob who became Israel, name changed to Israel. Um, and we look ahead to Jesus and we find someone, the, the only one actually, who was fully obedient, wholeheartedly obedient. And the Bible says he was obedient even to the point of death, even to the extent, to the extreme of, of death and death on a cross, that horrible, shameful, agonizing, excruciating death. But he remained obedient, perfectly obedient. And so I, I'm really glad that we do not have to put our trust in Jacob. Jacob is not going to save us. He's not even going to show us the way to live. He's not even going to be our example. And we don't have to put our trust in any other failing human. But we can trust in one who is fully obedient and perfectly faithful. We, we made a little trip to Liverpool over the weekend so Ben could visit the university. We were there yesterday. It was really cold in Liverpool. <laughs> it's not always that cold in Liverpool, is it? <laughs> um, to be fair, Scotland could be even colder. But I managed to forget my, my woolly hat. Now, it's really freezing. So my girls kindly went to the Liverpool FC shop and they bought me, I've got it here somewhere, it's maybe my coat. Uh, a very a very nice uh, grey FC, Liverpool FC hat. So you'll see me wearing it. Uh, but Lisa told me that there was also other merchandise in that, in that shop, extolling the, the praises of Jurgen Klopp, the, um, the, the Liverpool manager. It's probably not quite so much the flavour of the month these days, but he certainly was a, a year or two ago, or maybe a few months ago. One said, uh, I don't know if it's a hat or whatever, in Klopp we trust... In God we trust, in Klopp we trust. But sadly, sadly for all Liverpool fans, Klopp, like Jacob, like us all, fails. He's not someone we can put our ultimate trust in. Failing humans, just like us. But when you come to Jesus, you find someone who is in a different league from every other human being. I submit that there's no one like him. He is the one who is perfectly obedient even under the most tremendous pressure. And he is fully faithful to the end. For us, he is completely dependable. As we come to him by faith in prayer, we come to one who is just rock solid. He's good. He's true. There's no wickedness. There's no darkness. There's not even a shadow in him at all. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Jacob was a man just like us, as the Bible says of Elijah, and he fell just like us, and he fell, I think, into complacency and to, into old habits just like we do. And this really is just like us. I see myself in the mirror of this chapter. I mean this way. When we've been very worried about something, some meeting, some appointments, some uh, reunion with even a family member, um, some test at school or college, and we have prayed desperately about it. I mean, we really poured it out before the Lord. Oh, please, Lord, please, Father, help me with this. And then the time has come, maybe not every time, but many times to our great surprise, our great relief, our great joy, everything goes really, really well, far above all our expectations. What has happened then? Well, we've been really thankful for a bit, haven't we? We've been walking on air, happy, in the, happy to, to know uh, God's grace. I think that's a pretty regular experience in the life of God's people. But what then often happens is that we, we fall back into complacency, don't we? We... we <laughs> Life becomes easier again, and we just 
fall back into uh, taking God's grace for granted. We stop depending on him. We stop praying. We stop realizing how much we, we need him. We sit back. We kind of fall asleep spiritually. And that is what we see with Jacob. It's what we see in the history of Israel in the Old Testament, and it is what we often find in our own lives. We quickly forget God. When the sun is shining and uh, we're sailing along, we quickly forget how much we need him. We lean back on our own understanding. We fall into old habits until it all starts to fall apart again, and then we, we run to him, don't we? Desperately, Lord, help me. Isn't that an awful thing? Isn't that a, isn't that a sad thing, really, that we do that when the Lord has been so good to us? Shouldn't it have the opposite effect when he's been so kind and gracious and rescued us? Shouldn't it make us even more thankful and obedient because of that? But instead, we, we often go the other way, don't we? I see Jacob falling back into old sins again, into old patterns, old habits. Now we do see, to be fair, we do see signs of the new Jacob here, the, the, the one they, that, that the Lord has called Israel, given a new name, a much better name, the man of faith. He gives credit to uh, God for his children in verse 5. God has graciously given your servant, he says. He, he gives credit again to God in verse 11 in a way that Esau never seems to do. Please accept, he says in verse 11, the, the present or the blessing that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me and I have all I need. He acknowledges that all that he has is through God, is from God. And then he sets up the altar, doesn't he, in verse 20, to the mighty God of Israel. That's what I think that those words mean, El Elohi Israel. So that there is, there is faith there, that there is something of the new, the new man there, the new nature. But there is also this old Jacob still trying to do things his, his, old, his own way, trying to manipulate uh, things. Um, in verse 13, for example, speaking to Esau about why he can't go with Esau, uh, he could simply have said that God had told him to go back to uh, the promised land. Instead, he, he, he cooks up this quite elaborate response, and it's pretty much an elaborate excuse. And I think it's really another kind of deception. That, I think, is the old Israel at work. In chapter 30, 34, possibly because he doesn't really get right back into the promised land, but sort of stops on the edges you find that the wheels start coming off again in his life in a, in a horrible, nasty... We'll see this next week. Some really nasty stuff going on in chapter 34 that may have been partly due to his decisions, his halfway obedience. See, we may have wonderful answers to our prayers. Sometimes we do, don't we? Every Christian knows this. But I think we need to beware when that happens and when God resolves things, maybe relationships that have been going poorly for us, that we don't fall back into complacency. I know how easy that is for me. I don't know if it's like that for you, but how easily. So suddenly everything's all right again. And, and, I, and, I, and I just, um, I, I just, I just, I tank, basically. Um, I mess up. Do notice what happens thereafter in 34. Just, you can have just a peek. We'll, we'll get to that next time. God's grace is such that it, he will not let us go. He will not let us go down that road without bringing us up again, without uh, teaching us, I'm afraid, the hard way. Sometimes we only learn the hard way, don't we? There are verses like that in Psalm 32. God says... To his people I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. But do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. There's an easy way, isn't there? And there's a hard way sometimes. And that is learning the hard way. When we are as stubborn as mules on going our own way, then God, because he loves us, 
tough love, fierce grace, will bring us back. And maybe that will be by the hard way. So there's great encouragement for us here in this chapter. Wonderful answers to prayer. Wonderful grace shown to the undeserving, to Jacob as to us. Answers above and beyond what we ask. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, the Bible says. He treats us far better than we deserve. But there's also the warning, the red light of warning, about how easily, when things go well, when things are resolved, by God's grace, we fall back into old sins, old ways, complacency. And that can bring into our lives God's loving, tough loving, necessary, even fierce discipline, because he loves us. Just as, you know, you do with your own children. We, we don't want to see them hurt, ruining themselves, going down a particular uh, way, road. He loves us too much to leave us in that condition. And so like the story of the prodigal son, he will work. His intrusive, relentless, fierce grace will work to bring us back to our senses, to bring us back to himself. And for that we are glad, aren't we? Great encouragement, but also great warning. May God speak to us through these words. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for these uh, pictures of uh, Jacob's life that are so um, reflective of our own lives, so much like our own. We, we do see ourselves in, the, in these pages uh, deliver us from that complacency, Lord, when life is, is going well and it's just sailing along. Help us instead to be truly grateful for your grace, to remember always our dependence upon you. Very quickly things can, uh, can change and, and the clouds can come over. Help us, Lord, to remain dependent and grateful and humble with you and to know your wonderful grace in our lives. Please change the hearts of those Father, in our families and our loved ones and those around us uh, who, who really need you, who really need to, to know you and to acknowledge you and to experience your, your wonderful grace, your, your fatherly love and care, throwing your arms around us and, and uh, taking such good care of us. Bless them, we pray. Change their hearts. Change our hearts too and make us more and more like Jesus, not like Jacob, but like Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.